When you start getting into higher value transactions, you're surrounded by a bunch of people who went into investment banking after studying corporate finance, and they like using their big words. And it's very important to understand the vocabulary to a degree, and this will help you immerse yourself. Welcome to another insightful episode of The Scaling Fastly. I'm your host, Valerie Booth. In this episode, we dive deep with Peter Lang, a mastermind in strategic acquisitions and innovative growth strategies. Peter shares his unique insights on leveraging business broker networks, optimizing deal sourcing, and navigating the complex world of mergers and acquisitions. With a focus on actionable advice, this episode is a must for anyone looking to scale their business through smart, calculated acquisitions. Get ready to learn the secrets of successful deal making in today's high stakes business environment. Let's listen in. So we've talked a lot about uh, Ava, and so for context. I told that story that when the pandemic hit, I said, we're not going to contract, we're not going to pull back, we're going to accelerate and grow. And how I went about doing that is what all agencies technically can do, they just maybe haven't thought about it yet. And so at the time, uh, I had a lead gen team, an outbound lead gen team that was servicing clients. And our sales team was using them for some outreach through LinkedIn and email and the normal ways of you know, setting up prospect conversations. And from a corporate business development background, I, I thought, well, I know brokers reach out. And I know from being an HR staffing consultant for my, before my agency days, that recruiters do that too. Well, couldn't I just take my lead gen team, which is a mixture of members and offshore and nearshore business development and just change the scripts up and reach out to owners of businesses about selling? Yeah, surprisingly. <laughs> it was exactly the same. <laughs> you just you work on it and you try to figure out if you know the target market, what resonates and how to get a response. To this day, the campaign still gets, since starting it, a 65% response rate. And it does not stop. Number one lead generation campaign we've ever managed. And how important is not just the percentage, but the duration of that performance to consistently go. But the good news is because the silver tsunami and the things that I talked about, you just have more and more opportunity. It just never goes away. Sellers are constantly coming into the market. So, what I'm going to walk you through is how we do that okay? and then why this response rate uh, is achieving the type of numbers it's doing. So before we get into uh, why you're going to use that tactic over all the other ways, I got to you know, the knowledge that you can represent to your prospective seller, right? I talked about researching and understanding the market you're participating in. You can use business brokers, online searches, cold calling, accountants, a good friend of mine, mail. he aggregates uh, daycares. And so for him, he wants daycares that also own the buildings. So really specific. He uses an outside investor to purchase the building, seller finances the daycare, and then wraps it in one single transaction. He's done 12, and he's probably going to do four again this year. And so there's a lot of ways to get in front of sellers. You just have to think where do sellers typically go? And you're going to see things like accountants, lawyers included in this, industry conferences, because just like this, I said, look to your left last night, to your right, there's deals to be made in the room, right? Everyone here wants to do deals. It's the same thing in every room you go to. Same exact thing, we just don't talk about it. So for business brokers, um, it's important to understand the industry of business brokerage. The reason is, even though we don't need brokers, brokers bring us deals all the time. We've closed a few broker deals as well. Um, it's always like, do we really wanna send this $50,000 to the broker? Fine, we closed the deal, it was a good deal, and it was expedited. So sometimes we do that. Uh, but it's important to understand how they work. Uh, Biz by Sell uh, is one of the most, from a volume perspective, sourced websites. It's also one of those websites that contribute to 80% of businesses not ever selling. So it's, it's great places to do research and look at deal to do practice. It also has the insights reports, so it gives you yeah. Now, there are uh, Main Street transactions. Main Street transactions, as you can see, are median revenue and asking prices. And the uh, statistics that they present are from their own site segment of transactions. But it just gives you an idea of what's going on. And what's important to know, which people don't emphasize, 
you, and any of you in real estate know this, median days on the market. For you real estate savvy folk, if a house has been on the market at a certain asking price for a long period of time, it's overpriced. 194 days, 200, that's a lot of overpriced companies, right? And that's why that graphic I showed you of asking price and purchase price was always reduced. Just important knowledge we're acting with. Um, business broker websites. We are Barney. Barney is a, uh, was founded by a former agency who sold. Amanda, who come to this uh, one. Good, good company. They, they, they're fair. They're, they're, they are fair. They've grown and now they have what everybody has whose founders are great. Less great people now interacting with businesses, uh, which can dilute the quality of their advice. They're now just managing people through a process. They're not really advising like they used to do. But these are typically where people go. I suggest signing up for those. You want to get deals sent to your inbox constantly. You need to see deals and just see them come through. It just keeps you attuned to what's going on. Uh, generational equity is absolutely terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. I will say that multiple times over because they're disappointing. All they do is present uh, copy-paste CIMs. Copy I mean, the highlighted investment considerations is copy-pasted in every company of the same category. It's, it's quite ridiculous. It's easy as shit. Once in a very, you know, cold blue moon night, they'll give you a good company. But most of them, uh, it's because they have a, a business of bringing, helping you build these things so you can exit. That's the business model. And but again, you can sign up because you can see the inputs of deals. You want to see the inputs of deals. You want to respond to it regularly, even though they're not a great source for transactions. I'm going to, because I want to get to some media and they didn't give me the most amount of time, I'm going to do this. Issues with business brokers. The issues uh, are uh, tied to what's called this pageantry. It's like dating. You dress nicely put on some perfume, some cologne, you present the best version of yourself when you're trying to attract a mate. Businesses do that too. But really to find a partner, you need someone who's giving you the most realistic version of themselves so you can figure out if that's someone you want to be with, right? So the narrative, which is what I emphasize, is finding someone who's sharing all that great information, and that means a broker has to really understand their clients. Now. There's a lot of red flags. Uh, Jeff shared an example where the broker shut him down immediately when he presented some strategic ways to approach the deal. This is where they don't always have their client's best interests because they're not financially incentivized to always do the strategic deal. Here's what the pageantry looks like. But this is also helpful too, so I'll, I'll, I'll state why it's helpful. Usually before a business is messy, there's a lot of hard work going into it. They don't run financials that have owner discretionary spending out of the company. They're not paying themselves a fair market rate or a normalized compensation for overpaying their executive teams. And the, there's a lot of uh, pessimistic management of your company, right? You, you don't always think of it as the most pristine thing. Day to day, you're dealing with the shit constantly. The problem, 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 issue, catastrophe, problem, problem. Yeah, good day, <laughs> right? That's how Constructed. It's a lot of hard work. So you feel like that in the very beginning. Brokers try to make it seem like it's an easy system. Our business is streamlined. Someone else could run this. Sales happen when I'm at an event constantly. The team. I'm always surprised by how much the team is taking over from me. Uh, we have well documented uh, procedures, and, and and it's we can tell you exactly what's going on at a given time. And the future is so optimistic you the performance in this. That's the way the company is going, obviously. We've had, had some ups and downs, but, but definitely moving forward, we are trending upwards. And if you go to generational equity, CIM, all, all, all of the CIMs have this an assumption of growth rate off of historical pro, uh, past that then is just projected into the future. It doesn't make sense, does it? right? It, it, it's hard to go, well, I just took this gap and I continued it out. That's not how things work. Do you forecast your own businesses that way? Right? So those are the things that are really annoying. Uh, there's some economics around it. So business brokers get success fees, retainers, and a combination of a few. Um, 
We do work with what's called sell side brokerage when we go to Main Street and private equity backed strategic buyers. What that means is there's a category of investment banking that are selling to billion dollar companies. They're very helpful then. They are helpful then. So the fact that we have seven people on the legal team, we have, I mean, it's a more involved transaction. And so there's a place for the investment banker in there. Uh, usually, here's the ranges. So people want to know what are the build sizes uh, and business sizes for various levels of brokerage. Uh, Main Street businesses, there's usually a 10%, 12% fee associated with that transaction. Lower middle market are between 1 million and 25 million in revenue. And then they do something called the Lehman, double Lehman. I'll explain briefly what that is. It's just a percentage breakdown of uh, the value of the transaction and then certain percentages on certain you know, truncated amounts, like a million, 10% of the first million, then you got 8% on the second million, 6% on the third. It's just a way to not have it be a flat fee, which would be erroneous and excessive to the transaction. And then of course, investment bankers, uh, the transactions are so large, you're like, I just take 4%. And most uh, investment bankers in our space want to do between a million and 1.5 million per deal. That's what they're looking to take. Okay, kind of the sell price commission broker fee scenario. You heard me say, you know, we have no problem writing the $50,000 payment to them or wiring the money because of that kind of not sell price, but percentage fee. And we try to look in a fixed fee personally. Uh, it depends on who's the representation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we pay it if someone brings us a deal. Uh, double Lehman was that percentage I was referring to. And the double Lehman equates out of $3.6 million uh, sell price to about a $264,000 broker fee. The broker business is a good business if you're good at brokering. Let's put it that way. And you have the right access to people. So here's just the uh, uh, terminology. Uh, when you start getting into higher value transactions, you're surrounded by a bunch of people who went into investment banking after studying corporate finance, and they like using their big words. They really do. And so you'll hear these things thrown out, and it's very important to understand the vocabulary to a degree. Um, and this will help you uh, immerse yourself. It's a good tactic that I was taught at a very young age. I never pay an expert to do something for me. I pay an expert to teach me how do the thing or explain it to me. So you don't prep an LOI. I don't pay you to prep an LOI. I pay you to prep the LOI, then review the LOI and explain it to me on a video call that then I transcribe. And then my assistant bullets out. <laughs> then I know how to do the LOI. So that's what I pay for. And that's what I've always paid for, which has given me leaps and bounds beyond what I would consider others who just pay for the outside advice to provide. All right. Um, you really have to think, how do you connect your investment of time and energy? So this is a form of training course. This is a form of education. How do you 10x your investment that you put in both in time and energy? And how you do that is understand how to source deals. And so if you don't get in front of deals, and within the first 90 days of leaving here, you don't find sellers, you did not really learn that much. Because even if you don't want to buy now, the process of starting conversations with people who want to sell will feed your ambition and interest to grow your own business organically, incrementally, and through acquisitions. I challenge everybody to have these conversations and be very transparent. Right? You're just having conversations with people about the current state of the economic climate, their business, thinking about partnerships, being very friendly and open. And if they want to talk about selling at some point, you'd love to entertain it. But go through the exercise and practice of having these discussions and use these listing websites, use business brokers to help you get your first steps until you build a proprietary sourcing engine, which we'll get to. The good thing about business brokers, all uh, businesses, business brokers do help you get something that's prepared. They'll put, put a data room together, they'll clean up some things, they'll give you the seller discretionary earnings or the ad backs, and it will just help you practice without you having to educate the seller from the very beginning. So it's a good way for you to build up some reps and have some initial conversations. Um, also, uh, if you build a relationship with the broker, 
the you know, self-financing deal right away. Uh, they can bring you other deals, <laughs> okay? Per Jeff's story, this call is over and they don't call Jeff back. So there are some good advantages uh, to what it is you're looking for. And in our mentorship program, I think we're covering identifying targets. Uh, so how do you go about identifying the right kind of target? You can feed that to a broker, you have anyone who looks like this. The guideline I like everyone to take from this is just because someone's listed their business to sell does not equal a motivated seller. There are more tire kickers than there are motivated sellers. And you would say, well, they're listed on the website. They hired a broker. They're not tire kickers. They're committed. No. No. Don't. It's, it's an illusion, illusion. They are giving themselves a pass. They're feeling like they're making progress, but interestingly enough, 80% of them that list never transact, and it's not because the brokers are terrible or the sites are bad. It's the owners aren't ready to make the choice, or their spouses aren't ready for the choice. Making a decision to sell something that's an asset, depending on how your wealth is managed, is usually outside of your just general interest and control. And so often they list, they go through this process, but they didn't get buy-in. At home, they didn't get buy-in from partners. Online searches, Google find it pretty easy. Um, I, be you know, I believe that NDAs are kind of comedic. There's not that much that we can really say is uh, safe and secure in a service business. This stuff, as you heard from the attorneys, are hard to defend against, right? But you do want to do NDAs. And the reason for that is very simple. Even though there's been a lot of discussion about them being kind of worthless to a degree and not really meaningful, it makes the other person feel like you're going to treat it with some sensitivity, okay? It's about making people feel comfortable not the legal components of non-disclosure. So uh, I, I don't have it in here, but I'm going to make sure you have this advice. If you go into a bank and the banker is wearing a Marvel Comics t-shirt, and has board shorts and flip-flops, do you feel really comfortable about it? There's uniforms in industries. So there is a and this is doesn't, it's not a requirement, but there is a degree of uniform in every interaction that we have, right? Police wear uniforms so we can see that who they are and what they do. Firefighters have uniforms. People wear certain things so we are conditioned to some level of responsibility, respect, can identify them. Same thing goes with deals. Same thing goes with deals. Are the most successful people wearing hoodies and t-shirts? Yes, for sure. Are there are degrees of this? Well, we found you're dealing with someone who needs to trust you to transact with you. That's required. Trust to transact. Without it, you don't. You have to think, what do they expect from the person who's buying their company? So it's a little bit off of my subject, but I just want to make sure everyone knows there is uniforms in all industries in business. And yes, there are shirt times where you can wear whatever the heck you want, but keep in mind how you wear, how you demonstrate, that's gonna influence your rate of doing deals. Listing sites, here's some listing sites. This is done so you can take photos. And again, you gotta consume the content. You gotta go through uh, and get the reps. If you don't get the reps, how do you expect to perform in the highest point of pressure, right? Like sports. You don't wait till the championship game, the final play, to maybe practice a new play, right? These things are practiced. And you go around a broker and communicate directly with the owner. That's what some people have asked in the past, and I say don't. Don't be an asshole. Like, if you source them directly, fine, but be respectful to the industry that it's in, no matter how much variation and quality exists. I'm a fan of using your accountants and lawyers to find deals, okay? You heard it. Andy talk about, a, I acquired two of his clients. Why? Because lawyers know the condition of the website, condition of the brand, condition of the business. They actually know, if they care about their clients, they know them pretty well. They help them with the company, they help them with contracts, they help them with issues that are Lawyers can introduce you to someone who they might feel is a good fit. I've gotten roughly four deals, two from an accountant, two from an attorney. Very helpful. And accountants know the financials. Do you know how fun it is when an accountant brings you their client because they know you're a good fit for their client because they 
See, both financials? Talk about the, yes, this is a good match because they see the matching in the financials. They go, dude, you complement each other very well. Build relationships. And you tell people you're actively sourcing, you're looking to do a deal this year. Okay? So lawyers, because they have multiple companies as clients, you go and ask them. Say, hey, you have clients looking for an acquisition. Do you have any clients that might fit this? I'd love to build a relationship with you because you could help us identify and communicate with them really well. And you'll it'll be amazed that they're like, yes, I would love to. Uh, but accountants and lawyers are deal killers. Actually, it's just a profession. The profession is to help you mitigate risk of the clients. That's their job. Their job isn't there to do whatever it takes to get a deal done. Okay. So why? It's because their job is designed to help you find errors, mistakes, list all the cons, give realistic and pessimistic perspectives off of their experience. That's how they help you. Okay? That's their job. So of course, why we, we don't expect anything else. Uh, but they are very limited. And I, I touched on this previously that lawyers are limited to what you tell them about the deal. So they're just giving you advice off of what You've said. So if they don't know that you've had 10 hours worth of conversations, you've talked about this beautiful future, you see the synergies of your company, lawyers and experts don't know this. So they're not going to include that in their advice. Okay? Yeah, industry is required to do that, right? Or else uh, they can lose a lot of credibility, right? Their job isn't to extend beyond the, the financial statements, right? That's, that's the, they're, they're not supposed and it's also a different demeanor. Uh, Dana, who was on stage, right? The tax person. You have to be a certain type of accountant who likes tax. So Dana's energy is going to be, she likes tax. <laughs> Do any of you like tax? <laughs> no. So there's certain characters based upon the industry you're in that kind of requires a certain mental aptitude, a personality. It's, it's not surprising that they're not deal makers, right? That's not, that's not what they're there for in a deal. They're there to help you understand risks and liabilities. Your network can bring you great deals, so you tell everybody, you tell everybody you're looking to do deals this year. You all said I want to do deals this year, right? I want, I want to do some deals. You need to be saying that now because you will never get anything in life unless you put out there that you want it, right? If, if you're single and you don't have the best way not to get one is to not tell anyone you're looking. <laughs> okay, so this is the list of like what we I would classify as your network. I've closed the deal from almost every source. Okay, and if you look at courses and mentors, that's what we are, right? The mentorship program deals are created in here because you have people of like-minded interest wanting to do similar things, and that's how you get done. You obviously know enough about your network. You're savvy, folks. Industry conferences. So the silver tsunami. Uh, th this is this is terrible. It works really well. You go to an industry conference, and all you do is target everyone with gray hair. <laughs> you just target the gray hairs. That's how it is. And if they have gray hair growing in the hair, well, you can go. Oh, that's a good future operator. <laughs> They're in the 40s age. <laughs> And you're like, all right, silver tsunamis. Let's chat. And it's true. It's actually it's a, it's a good tactic. Uh, uh, young people do this for older men and women who are wealthy. That's a different game. This is about business acquisition. <laughs> okay. So similar tactics, very different intentions. Cold outreach. So what everyone wants to know about. So um, what will I expect? What's my favorite? We use LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the best possible platform, and the reason for this is simple. We all have agreed to play the game. Apparently, we all continue to keep it up to date, more up to date than Instagram about our business. So yes, you can source a variety of other deals in other places. LinkedIn still is a dominant platform, and it's grown dramatically over the past few years. It's been accelerated, um, and we don't see it slowing down. Uh, another great tool is for uh, email outreach. So this is Grobots. Uh, I've known uh, Greg, the founder of Grobots, from Poland, then San Francisco. Terrible employees went back to Poland. Um, but tools like this where you can do email uh, outreach. So you can generate a list. You can find the number of agencies. Do by company size of employees, because really employee count is a hidden indicator of size. Right? Except for some anomalies. Uh, and 
So that's usually how you do segmentation. You can't find companies by profit. <laughs> Unfortunately, that would be great. You can do that in Europe, actually, which is uh, quite interesting. Uh, you can. Uh, you can do it in the UK. You can actually source by uh, business financials because of the disclosure requirements. Um, cold calling and outreach on LinkedIn. So uh, I've had my LinkedIn manage uh, since 2000, I want to say 17. That's probably about when. And it's been managed ever since. I don't manage my own LinkedIn. It's been uh, all of my connections exist in spreadsheet segmented by type and category. And then I'm able to implement various campaigns from that. And so this is what the team that we have do uh, data enrichment. So uh, going and scraping the data manually. Yes, you can build tools and you can do things. I'm a big fan of building standard operating procedures within a business that don't break terms and conditions. Pretty simple. Yes, is it labor intensive? Yes, do you have to figure out other ways of doing it? And yes, are there shortcuts to efficient software? Yes. But the terms and conditions of LinkedIn state don't do those things. So what kind of example am I leading if I'm saying, yes, but I'm willing to take shortcuts and, and scrape sites in ways that you're not supposed that would not to? I lead by moral example because I want to do more, period. So it's been managed by teams. And we employ them. Uh, we, we have a training program for it. And this is the information they gather. Uh, and this is in the spreadsheet. So I have this for every contact uh, or connect to LinkedIn. Very helpful, by the way. What should you expect? It's a numbers game. I told you that we have a 60% uh, response rate. Um, it's because, very simple, uh, it's a very aggressive net. <laughs> um, and you have some expectations of how this performs. We actually have a sales enablement program that the agency deployed, and it built it on the clients. So that's how I knew what to expect, right? I had a team that did this professionally for clients. So when I just had the on M&A outreach, I'm like, okay, should we expect the same? And we outperformed all clients, and they used uh, my account as an example. I said, don't do that, because that's not normal, and I'll show why it's not normal. Um, do you know the difference between these two charts? Sure. Ah, yeah, ah, ah, David, yeah. Uh, if, if I were to say, let's fly to Switzerland, Ellen, this weekend, we'll fly to Switzerland. Fondue and Toblerone. So we're getting on a flight. We'll do first class because, uh, and we're going to climb, not far, but we'll do a hike in one of the Swiss Alps. And we'll get one of the large Toblerones. And we're going to climb to the top and we're going to have that Toblerone with a beautiful vista of Alps, beautiful day. That's, that's a very specific image. But you heard how much cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching I needed to get there? It's a very expensive image. The more specific you are on the types of businesses you want to acquire, the more expensive it is. A lot of people go, I want to buy this business. The more specific you are, the more expensive it will be. Because you don't want to get anything else. So you will overpay. But if you're like, I just want chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Right? There's chocolate everywhere. You can get any type of chocolate. Right? So it's really important to note that when you hear about doing deals and they're like, get very specific about what you want to buy, go after this specific company, and you name that company and know the person who runs it, you're probably going to overpay. You're too invested into a more expensive journey with them. You're too specific. I want to grow through acquisitions. I want to find complementary companies. I don't want chocolate. So you, you're, you're, you're already specific. Just going too specific. Ellen and I had a conversation. I'll use it as a quick example. Like, I want an immersive agency. As long as she's not saying I want an immersive agency in Southern California, preferably in this neighborhood, right? as long as you don't get too narrow, then you're going to have to pay more because they may not be motivated to buy. The terms that company you specifically want may not jive. You got to have options. You got to be able to walk away. It's a lot easier to walk. You need to build trust. Trust to marketers often sounds uh, disrespectful, but oftentimes we're not doing it for ourselves. So I'm going to state why you need to do this. Um, you need to make sure if you're going to do deals, you have to have a place online that they can self-evaluate and qualify your legitimacy of doing deals. 
And that can just state intention, right? You can say in 2020 is uh, we're looking for these types of businesses we want to buy. This is you. Please fill out this form. We'll be in contact, right? Because they need to be able to go check you out. They need to check out your LinkedIn. Everyone, you take a first call to buy them, they've checked your LinkedIn. And if they didn't, tire kickers, kick them out anyway. Everyone who is at all interested verifies before they show up to a first call, right? In service, right? You need to make sure your LinkedIn says these things about you. You need to have a website that talks about what you're going after. But it's an example. Peter here has a uh, investor group model. This was an old, we start by an investor of agencies. I call that baby Ava. Um, that was Ava before it was Ava. And we always had a brand online that supported the thing we were saying in our outreach. Um, I'll give you outbound sales uh, secrets. Outbound sales secret number one is don't have a shitty website, right? If you're going to invest in accelerated outbound activity, mass volume, you need to have a website that can validate, legitimize, and sell for you because you probably don't have a whole sales team. So your, your website has to be your best salesperson. You've all heard that before, right? Well, therefore, in buying companies, you have to have a website that sells the fact that you can buy their company confidently. Okay. And then uh, it could be with is you need to have character references. So acquired Tony's company. Nice person to have as a reference when talking about acquiring other people's company. Nick Nyberg, I helped him do his merger and he had a multiple exit for his iconic. And so you have to have people, and you should do this to each other in the room. You should get to know each other, give each other uh, you know, re recommendations, say I was really impressed by the way that they're doing this in their business. You need this. Now when you transact, so those of you who have done deals, raise your hand again. Before you screw it up, ask no reference. Ask LinkedIn about the transaction. Okay, and then maybe you won't screw it up. Of course, hopefully not. But ask them to give a reference about the deal time, because if you have people what it's like to do a deal with you, that resolves. I have video testimonials of what people did after I gave them their money. <laughs> so I close the definitive agreement. I get them to record a testimonial about the experience of doing a deal with me that I can share with the next person. Why? Because it's programmatic M&A. Testimonials speed up the sales process in general sales, right? If they address objections, it's the same thing in buying a company. If you have a video from someone who you purchased, you give that to the next person you want to buy. Because that's what they ask for. Can I talk to someone who's done a deal with me? A different website where you do, you put yourself as the owner of company that does, and you say, this one company that I own buys these types of businesses. Okay. It doesn't have to change your whole plan. You need to note it. So when they check you out, they go to those careers, and they see that, oh, she's present. Oh, what's this thing? And then they, they go deep enough. Okay? So you, you can do it there. You can wink at it, but make sure there's links to it. The, the number one thing I communicate to clients who ask why we do M&A, it's simple. I want to service you better with the highest quality of talent, and the best way I can do that is through acquisitions. I already have a great team to support you. I go out and try to find more ways to service you better. And that's the job of a CEO. By the way, a CEO's job is to grow a company using external means. Anyone who talks about uh, being a CEO and focusing on growing it using internal means is not a CEO. A CEO's job is to report to the board, technically. Interact with external stakeholders on behalf of the company. Not manage the company, that's a COO. Most of you are COOs, not CEOs. It's interesting, right? CEOs are not just the people who have the strategic vision about the company. No. They manage the relationship with the external stakeholders. That's why it's a required position under the government. Um, let's make sure I have time to get some of these things people really like. Uh, you use software to manage your leads. Uh, we recommend using uh, a CRM. We like HubSpot. We create a deal pipeline, and that deal pipeline is where an agency is, where a target business is in the process. Why? You have three new conversations a day. <laughs> you can lose track of who you're talking to really quickly and blur the names. Uh, we create automation at, at a stage of volume in that uh, to save us time. You, and HubSpot's a good tool for that. Use all uh, e-signatures for everything. E-signatures for everything. Uh, the NDA is actually a 
NDA on the website. So it's the domain.com slash MA mutual. And they go there and they fill out the form and they submit a form. And we picked brokers. Broker was do that. They have you sign the non-disclosure forms on a website that just lists the terms and conditions because they're, they're stock. They're stock disclosure forms. You don't tailor it to all your parties and then they submit it and do it that way. So we don't have to send docs for NDAs. Just go to done. Really efficient, really fast. Fill this out before you hop on the call. Because when you send someone an NDA contract, for us to see this? No, no. Just go to, it's a stock, everyone signs it, it's pretty boilerplate, there's intended to be that way. You have to have all your outreach scripts already written. This is what it looks like to launch a campaign. So uh, if you're trying to generate outreach, uh, you need to generate lists. If you don't have it, I gave you some tools that you can do list generation from, or you can have uh, a platform, go to certain sites and write down the names, find the owners. Uh, what's tricky about LinkedIn is you have what's called the connection request lag. So you have to target industries that people log into LinkedIn and accept connection requests. Right? If someone's not active in requests, you have the lag from them accepting you to be able to send a message. Now you may say, isn't there a premium tool where you can do it? Yes, but who really? to respond to sales navigator messages about buying your company, right? No, you want to connect with someone, they'll go look at your profile, they'll go, oh, that's, this person's just like me. They run an agency. Oh, great, okay, they're normal. Oh, and they are looking to invest and buy in business. Oh, cool, so I'll connect with them. They seem interesting, I'll give you a script for that too. But you're, you have higher probability of connecting with people who look just like you, and this is very disheartening for many, but your, the response rates have been proven to be higher with uh, accounts that reach out that have uh, name, origin, and skin tone, and profession, and age. So if you want to acquire, uh, say, if we want to increase the amount of women, minority women, in our pipeline, I probably need to count reaching out, obviously. Right? My wife actually should. And we got, that's how we knew this data was true. Uh, Tony Atkins. We get a lot of Southern like folk. <laughs> with Tony around. Tony's pretty Texan. And so what we found is if you want to diversify your pipeline of potential acquisition targets, you need to have diversified representation in your outreach profile. Right? That could be hiring someone in that team. Um, let's just create some places to quickly go through it. If you need it, clutch, HubSpot directory portals, you know, say things like I get all the time. I never take these calls. I never go home on the first night. When you look like them and you don't come off threatening, people tend to just want to have these conversations, okay? So these are just some quick places. You can research them too. It's where you do research for your own industry. Um, it looks like outreach. It's pretty neat. Uh, our team's based in Serbia. Um, this is old enough, so I was able to this. Anyone? Let me just make sure. It would be hilarious. Okay, it's not there, but it would have been hilarious <laughs> if one of you were there. I just did a quick scan. <laughs> uh, so uh, the scripts are at the top. Tony, Vanessa, th this is their account track. And then we have uh, monitoring. So we have a management infrastructure for the lead gen team that does outreach. I, I thought, you know, just shows you how specific you can be, how well you can track it. And then we have uh, a blurred pipeline. Because <laughs> again, uh, this is actually really a fake blurred. So not only is it, was it a fake, it's also fake blurred. Uh, shows you the steps on top, because I was using it for uh, illustrative. Um, and so you can see appointment set, you can see all the stages there. Uh, uh, you know, selfish plug. The people who are with us in mentorship program knows this, we are over-indexing your success. Uh, it, you know, she'll get sample operating agreements we've used in organizations, she'll get stuff, she'll, get, she'll see the pipeline, we'll pull it up for her. I mean, we're, we're that level of wanting to uh, enhance the quality and production of the people who are close to us. This is one of those examples. It, will be, it won't be blurred. Uh, here's another uh, contact. So every call is documented. The lead gen list properly with the information that we want. So a quick reference on the first call. We, this also allows us to have continuity between the conversations. Right? So if I have someone else taking a call, I have someone else talking to someone else, you can't remember that information. Okay? So said I would give you uh, what an ideal week looks like. If you are uh, working in corporate business development, dirt, calendar, this is yours, you can take a photo. 
this is this needs to be your calendar. If this is not your calendar, you do not work in uh, M and A. You do not generate deals. Uh, this is the CEO's calendar. Typically, this is mine. When you're doing deals, and this is how it's budgeted, so you have the ability to respond to opportunities, right? If you're always booked, how are you going to take a new conversation with someone who you just got a response from, right? You need to have available windows. We then put this into, uh, this is how my life is actually executed. Uh, but you have buckets of time, and this is connected to your CRM, your calendar tools, and they can book within those times that are available. And then you need times to negotiate the deals that get into the pipeline. So you need to have reserved time to progress the deals through, right? Because if you get a bunch of people in some preliminary discussion with you, and they all move to the next call, they all move to the next call, you run out of time. All of you are also running the company, right? So you got to figure out how to the time. You can communicate this to your teams and say, this is blocked time for that. Um, other shameless plug because it's in the deck that I teach. This whole course that I teach is now included in our boardroom, by the way. I, I no longer sell it independently. I put it into it for a reason. Also because people need 28 more hours of me, obviously. Recorded hours. Uh, but at normal speed, so feel free to speed up. Um, we do this level of documentation. Um, we give this to those who are in our mentorship program. Uh, SOPs, so here's an example, so take a view of it. We say first call is scheduled, calendar invitation, link to it, playbook, what is said on that call. If today I hop on a call with someone who wants to sell a company, I have the same script I've been using for many, many years. It's the same script. Change. Maybe the year will change. I just have to keep it relevant, but it's the same script. It works. And then I have what we're looking to collect, which is interesting. He's not here. This is actually Tony Atkins, which is really funny. So June 30th, 2020, this is Tony Atkins' company. Because I made it with him. Because I, I was hiring a deal. I made him head of M&A, and I had to document and transfer. So all my standard operating procedures of M&A. Thanks for listening to the Scaling Fastlane podcast. If you enjoyed this content and are looking for a more immersive experience, Join us at the next Scale at Speed live event. It's packed with dynamic content, expert insights, and a room full of like-minded, action-oriented agency leaders. Come elevate your scaling journey in person. Visit scaleatspeedlive.com to ensure your spot today. We can't wait to see you there.